loved ones. Management 3234. Today is session 12. If we were meeting face to face, and gosh, I wish we were, it would be 7 July 2020. Um, I only have one admin thing to share with you, and that is simply to point out, <clears throat> excuse me, that our next class is um, me making a PowerPoint presentation to you on leadership. It's original content, it's my work product. Um, it's already up on Folio, and I put a link. Uh, I, I put a, a link you'll see under PowerPoint presentations for you to, uh, if not a link, I, I, I told you how to get there. So it's a, it's a video that's already up on the channel. Um, and uh, that, is, that is our next session. So I, uh, today is gonna be a presentation about business models. I will pull it up in just a moment. Uh, before I do, let me tell you a story, which may not be fascinating, but I'm really working hard to find different ways to verify attendance. So this story talks about ultimately the name of my truck. My oldest child is 40. My daughter Jennifer was born in 1980. And uh, we have a long, in my family, a long history of naming our vehicles. And a lot of them have been pretty goofy. Bruiser, Scooter, Rosie, a lot of goofy names. And it, and it meant something to the kids and we were happy to do things that pleased them. So a couple of years ago, 2018, I sold a vehicle that had been my daily driver for 17 years. I drove a, a Ford F-350, it's a one-ton pickup truck, turbo diesel. Um, I had driven it for 320,000 miles and I'd driven it for 17 years and for a variety of reasons it just made sense for me to sell that. And so I sold it to private sale and I bought an F-150. We special ordered the truck as I always do, got it exactly the way I wanted it. Um, the reason I went from an F-350 to an F-150 is I was no longer gonna be towing heavy trailers. Uh, one of the trailers that I had was uh, a 38 foot uh, triaxle car hauler and the GVW was 21,000 pounds, though I never loaded it to full, full gross. But uh, I, I'm not gonna be towing heavy trailers again, so having a half ton pickup truck with a naturally aspirated V8 was a good choice. Now, um, my family, not because they're cruel, but because they're fun and loving, immediately named my new truck the Minus 200. Pardon me. Head of 350, bought a 150. It's now the Minus 200. Well, that didn't hurt, but I had to do something different. But I don't just name things. There has to be some inspiration, whether it's a dog or a car or whatever the case may be. And I was sort of reflecting on that. The name didn't come immediately. And I thought, you know, I had my last truck 17 years. I may have this one 17. And then I thought, well, that pretty much matches up with my life expectancy. I bought the truck when I was 70. Uh, if I keep it 17 years, I'll be 87, 88, probably time to uh, ascend to heaven. So with warmth in my heart, I named my new truck 17. So it just seemed important that you knew that. So now, let me jump on the PowerPoint presentation. We spoke the last time we were together. I did, uh, I think it might've been chapter eight on business models. And it was well developed, and the material was well developed in the text. But I uh, taught this class before, and I thought that, that this discussion of business models should, should take a deeper dive, that you should have more information. So, here we go. So under PowerPoint presentations, you see the thing that I've highlighted right now that says 3234 summer 20 link to the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, that will get you to the one for our next thing. So today we're gonna to do the business models presentation. So, I realize that's a really clever title. I know it's a gift. I'll only use it for world peace. So, I want to point something out before I even begin. The principal source for this PowerPoint presentation was a book written a few years ago. Um, Osterwalder and, and Pigdor, um, Europeans, this kid Osterwalder kid, young man Osterwalder, did his dissertation on business models. And I think 
I think his dissertation committee sort of urged him to, to push it forward, to say this might really, um, it might play well as a book. There might be a lot of people who see practical benefit in this. So Oscar Walder wrote the book. This guy is his co-author. And uh, it's literally called Business Model Generation. Uh, it, it's a good resource, but it's not pathbreaking. However, what I've done is I've pulled a lot of things out of Oster Walder's book, and I've tried to augment it, tried to give examples of uh, practical application. So look at the definition. This is, this is really pretty mainstream, and, and it, it very much comports with, uh, I'm going to rotate the camera, because I can see some of that is not displayed. That is better. Um, we spoke about this, we talked about chapter eight, I think might've been our last session, but uh, a, a most excellent definition of a business model is it is an interdependent organizational process that is purpose built to create, deliver, and capture value for multiple stakeholders. You have to deliver value to your customers, you have to capture value to yourself. But I think this is a very competently done definition of a business model. So let me show you the framework that we're going to use. Oster Walder and his co-author would say to you, they, they take literally a building blocks approach. They say there are nine pieces to the puzzle. We have to deal with customer segments, revenue streams, partnerships, and the notation, the notation in his book and the notation that I will use occasionally in this presentation is presented. Customer segments is C, as value proposition. So together, we're gonna to look at each of those nine components, each of these nine building blocks, and then we will expand it beyond that. So let me start with the, the first one, customer segment thing. What it requires you to do if you're trying to build a business model is you have to answer two fundamental questions. And, and they're in tension. They are in opposition to each other. What segments do we serve and what segments do we ignore? That's a big deal. What if I decided, to sell ladies dress shoes. I'm gonna open a store, it doesn't matter if it's a if it's a net-based store or a physical store, it doesn't matter. But my only product is gonna be ladies dress shoes. So if I just look at women, I'm ignoring every other type of shoe. Uh, no boots, no athletic shoes, no casual shoes, just dress shoes. And in addition to me focusing on that one product for that one segment, I'm not selling anything for children, or men or young adults or anything else. So that isn't bad, but these are critical questions. What segments will I serve? What segments will I ignore? Some companies don't ignore any segments. This is not a criticism. Toyota is one of them. If you look at the global auto industry, with the exception of performance cars, Toyota's got a chicken for every pot. Toyota has compact sedans, mid-size sedans, full-size sedans, crossovers, Sport utility vehicles, pickup trucks. It has a luxury division, which it calls Lexus. Um, when I say they have no performance cars, um, they have a new vehicle called the Supra that was built collaboratively with BMW, but it, it's uh, hard to call it a performance car. It looks cute. Uh, I'm not interested in cute, unless it's a puppy dog, and then I'll take it home. So, what segments do we serve? Are we all things to all people? Are we specialists? What segments do we ignore? How do those questions have to be answered? And look at the criteria that we would use to define a segment. A segment is simply a group of customers who have shared needs. College students would represent a segment. Young families, you know, adults with children, would represent a segment. Seniors would represent a segment. But look at these criteria. Do the customer needs justify a distinctly different offering? What does the segment need? For example, is it mass market? I just talked about Toyota as being a provider of mass market automobiles, and in this example, I use General Motors. Or is it a niche offering? Is it a specialization? Tesla, first of all, is only in the business of electric vehicles, and Tesla launched on a single product, the Model S. It was a six-figure car, $100,000, $110,000. And of course, Tesla is now trying to round out its product line. It brought out the Model Y, which is a, a crossover. I saw two this morning, a white one and a blue one. Uh, it has the Model 3 on the market, and they're talking about the stupid Cybertruck and, and you know, tractors and for uh, pulling 53-foot trailers and things like that. So 
when you when you offer a car that costs a hundred bucks and it's electric power, you clearly are, are identifying a very small market. Tesla sells about three hundred thousand cars a year. General Motors sells about um, upwards of nine or ten million a year. Three hundred thousand, nine or ten million. Very big difference. So the the customer needs to justify a distinctly different offer. Now, how do you reach the customers? Look at this thing about distribution channels. Do people go in a store? I go to TC Outdoors regularly, two or three times a week. However, how many of you buy stuff on social media? How many of you are influenced by that? How many of you literally tap on some sort of a buy now button? So, what are the distribution channels? Uh, how do we reach people? How do we get the product in their hands? What about different types of relationships? For example, I'm using Banking, investment banking versus traditional banking. If my needs are just for traditional banking, I'm well served if I have a bank where I've got a checking account and a money market account in a safe deposit box. However, if I'm a high wealth individual, I'm gonna need that, right? I'm gonna need a financial advisor, someone who's, who's uh, helping me plan for retirement, uh, to fund uh, college education for children, whatever the case may be. So, do we need different relationships? That's a very big deal in terms of defining a segment. Do segments have very different profit potentials? Uh, for a number of years, I wore Timex watches, and I never spent more than 35 bucks on them because they were disposable. So if I pay Walmart 30 or 35 bucks for a Timex watch, my guess is Walmart bought it from Timex for 20 or 25. So how much does Timex make? I don't know, five, 10 bucks a watch? I don't know, but on a $35 watch, it's not a lot. The entry-level Rolex today, as I stand in front of this camera, is a watch called a Submariner. It is the most excellent diver's watch, and it starts at 10 grand, and you can spend six-digit money for Rolexes. But you have a $10,000 watch versus a $35 watch. What is the profit potential? That question has to be answered. And then, the last piece of this that helps define the segment are customers willing to pay for different aspects? For example, do people pay separately for service? When you buy a new car or truck, yes, you get a warranty, but there's still maintenance things that you have to do, oil changes, tire rotations, things like that. Uh, and if you have to do that, if you don't do it willingly, you will shoot yourself in the foot, won't you? Um, what about subscriptions? What about, uh, look at the Harry's Razor guy. Uh, Harry's was selling razors like on a monthly deal and then some big company like Schick bought them and they've gone away. Uh, is the offering transaction based? Do I go to Amazon and buy a book? Or is it a subscription service like a Netflix or, or something like that? So the point is that when we talk about customer segments, we're talking about groups of people who have similar purchasing needs. You have to start by answering those two questions. Which segments do I serve? What segments do I ignore? There has to be a reasoning behind that. And then the criteria to define segments is meant to be helpful, it really is. So we're probably going to value proposition next. And yes, I happen to get that right. Value proposition definitionally, a bundle of benefits that either solves a problem or satisfies a need. How cool is that? Value propositions may be quantitative. They may be reducible to something that's objective and measurable. Um, uh, speed of delivery. Uh, I understand that Amazon has about 65 million people who bought the Prime membership. I think it's $120 a year. Because with limited exceptions, if you're a Prime member and you buy something on Amazon, it's two-day shipping. So people are willing to pay a buck twenty a year to get almost everything they buy shipped in two days. Um, so there are other examples, but that's quantitative. That's something that, that has a clear, discernible economic value. Qualitative is something very different. Aesthetics. How many people buy clothing because of the texture of the material? How many women buy shoes because they think they're cute? And, and I, don't, I don't say that cynically. That's an aesthetic decision. People buy cars because they find them to be attractive. And, and that's an individual perception, isn't it? I can look at a Chevy Tahoe when I see a very handsome vehicle. You may say, it looks like a freight container. Well, you can think that. It's pleasing to me. And then, when we talk about the customer experience, 
there is an entire segment of industry now. In fact, people are even doing this in their LinkedIn profiles and on, on resumes. They're saying, have meaningful experience in USX, the user experience. The guy that's now the CEO at Ford is a man named Jim Hackett. He ran a furniture company before he became the CEO at Ford. And he really focused on this user experience thing, and he was quite successful. And Ford is hoping that that, that success in that other domain will, will evidence itself in, in the global auto industry with Hackett as CEO. Because a great deal about automobiles is the user experience. It's sitting in the vehicle, it's those things that, which are tactile, knobs, controls, the, the fabric on seats, the, the, the covering of the wrap on steering wheels. There's an awful lot that goes in a car that's a user experience. And the same is true with your tablet, with a hundred other things. So this notion about customer experience is a big deal. But you see this value proposition? It can either be measurable or it can be highly subjective. They're both important. They're both important. Now, I know that this is a long list, but please digest it. Common attributes that create value are performance improvements, okay, customization. People build something just for you. When I say design or features, the people that, reason people pay big money for Rolex is Rolex builds a lot of desirable features into its watches. Um, the cases and the bracelets are always stainless steel, very, very durable metal, very attractive. The, uh, the watches are, are certified Swiss chronometers. They're attractive pieces of jewelry. If they're divers watches, they, they still function to a depth that would make a submarine implode. So Rolex builds in a lot of features to its watches. And that is why people think, I'll pay 10 grand for that, or whatever, whatever it is that they pay for a specific watch. Brand or status. If you get you a Toyota Camry, you drive an appliance. If you get you a Lexus ES300, Hmm? Is that a better S now? You're driving an entry-level luxury car, aren't you? Same vehicle, different badges. But a lot of people really key on status. I wear, I wear car arts that I buy at Tractor Supply. Many of you probably buy designer jeans, okay? Both of us are wearing brushed cotton or right denim. Some of them have high status, some of them are work. Reduction of cost. Could you buy something, and if, and if it reduces your cost, I buy Michelin tires for all of our street cars, primarily because I get extreme service life out of them. Easily double what any other brand of tire gives. That is both a design component and a manufacturing component. But the point is, I spend money for Michelin tires and I get long service life. I get reduction of cost because I don't have to buy the tires as frequently. Reduction of risk, warranties, loved ones. That's why we buy new cars, isn't it, or new trucks. If you get you a new ride, there's a warranty. Bumper to bumper for 336 or 450, whatever it is. And oftentimes, other things are extended. The, the uh, diesel truck that I, that I mentioned earlier in this presentation, the engine had a 100,000 mile warranty because diesels are very, very durable. And, and my point is, we pay big money for the vehicle, but what that says is that for three or four or five years, we have no expenses if there's a failure. We're gonna pay for maintenance. We're gonna pay for batteries or brakes or oil changes or tires, but we're not gonna pay for failures. So the point is that uh, warranties reduce the risk on whatever it may be. Access, net jets. Now I, I have several Gulfstream G650s. I have different colors because faculty are stinking rich. And they're only 65 million a piece, so why wouldn't I have several? But people who aren't stinking rich, like the faculty here, they don't necessarily buy their own biz jet. They buy access to it by getting a fractional ownership. They buy into Wheelsoft or NetJets or some other, some other operation that will literally permit them to fly all over the world but at a very, very modest cost relative to owning five or six golf streams like I do. Yeah. And convenience. You know how 
how many universities just are nothing but online? Phoenix, uh, Southern New Hampshire, Walden, uh, there, there are so many that are Kaplan, uh, Capella, they're all online, and they're only online. They're not a university that has a fiscal presence that also delivers education online, which is precisely what we are doing right now. But my point is that there are a lot of people who value the convenience. Now, you don't learn spit, but it's convenient. So you learn nothing, pay a lot of money, but it was a convenient experience. Yes, convenience, bad decision. All right, I can't remember which one is next. So the number three building block is channels, heck yes. Now, Oscar Walder and his co-author tell us the channels have five distinct phases. These are essentially points in time, aren't they? Let's start with awareness. How do you arrange awareness of a new product? You know how many companies successfully use social media to create a buzz? Ford, right now, the Ford Bronco is being reintroduced. It went out of production in 1996. The Ford Bronco is being reintroduced. Uh, it's going to come in two forms. One of them is going to be a Bronco that's based on the Ranger platform. It will actually be a sport utility vehicle. It's like a truck. It's body on frame. It'll be off-road capable, and it'll be a very, very uh, high-demand vehicle. The other Bronco is built on a car platform. It's built on, not a car actually, a crossover. It's built on the Ford Escape. And they're literally right now calling it the baby Bronco. But here's my point. Ford has, has uh, announced this vehicle three years ago, 2017, are you kidding me? And they're not gonna have them on the ground until 2021? That's wrong. It makes no sense at all that there would have been that lag, but that's what's going on. But the point is, Ford is doing all sorts of activity to raise awareness. It's leaking spy photos. You can go to YouTube today and probably just put in Ford Bronco and get 20 videos that, that purport to tell you what the new Bronco is gonna look like you know, based on leaked information and speculation and an occasional spy photo. But the point is, uh, uh, there are other ways to raise awareness, but if you think about that, it, it's often smart to use social media channels to simply raise awareness about new products or new services. Um, evaluation. How would a customer evaluate our value proposition? Value proposition, I wanna go back to something that, that we've talked about in the last session. Value is the relationship between price and performance. What information do we present that permits them, the customers, to evaluate the relationship between the price that they're going to pay and the performance that they're going to get for that? Purchase, how do people actually purchase our product? I can go to the Ford.com website, I can go to 100 other websites, but I gotta show up at a Ford dealership if I wanna buy a new Bronco, don't I? because that's the law in, in all the 50 states. The only exception is Tesla, and Tesla is, is populated by weirdos. Um, but the point is that if I want to buy a new Ford, the only place I can get a new Ford is from a franchise Ford dealer. I can, I can arrange financing, I can look at what's inventory, I can do all sorts of stuff online, but I must go to the dealership to literally sign the documents and take physical possession of, of the vehicle. So the point is, how do you actually purchase the products? Now, how many things can you and I buy online? Actually, quite a bit. But I don't want you to be seduced. Um, online shopping represents about 8% of the entire retail sales in the United States. I don't know what they do in China or Europe or New Jersey or other foreign countries. But in the US, the most recent data I have is 2018, and, and online shopping represents nine, rather 8% of retail. By the way, Amazon has half of it. Amazon has 4% of the eight. So Amazon is kind of a big dog in, in the online shopping world. But do you see my point? If 8% of it's online, that means 92% of it is face to face. Because everything that's important in our lives is physical. Energy, food, transportation, medicine. Everything that's important in our lives is physical. And yet, how much do people obsess about, oh, I'm gonna scroll through my tablet and my phone and, and buy 44 new pairs of shoes or whatever it is that they buy. Um, I get it that it's convenient, but at the end of the day, it's trivial. It is trivial and non-significant. So how do customers actually purchase? Can I buy food online at, at Waffle House? I'm pretty sure I can't. Is there a mobile app? Can I order it? 
and either have it delivered or picked up, but I ain't buying it online, am I? How is it delivered? I just went down that road without planning on it. I talked about automobile, new car transactions. I talked about food, either takeout or delivery. How is it delivered? Um, and then critically on many things, what is the after sales support? What post purchase support do we offer? We, the company. Um, it's improbable that I would buy anything new and expensive if it didn't offer some sort of after the sales support. Would I drop two grand on a new laptop if nobody supported it? Absolutely not. Would I spend $55,000 for a new pickup truck if there were not both a warranty and a repair shop where people are trained and have the correct tools? No, I wouldn't do it. So how do we answer that question? What is the after sales support? Now, channels can be direct. Uh, Bean has company stores, Cabela's has company stores, I get that. Or they can be indirect. We can partner with websites like Amazon. How many people are resellers on Amazon? The answer is a very big number. And of course, channels can either be owned or accessible through partners. So these are just some thoughts on channels. How do we reach the people to whom we sell products or services? And the fourth building block in this exciting thing is customer relationships. You see the top line? These things are often called touch points. Now, if you automate them, it's hard to call it a touch point, isn't it? But touch points are personal or automated. How many of you go to Amazon or Netflix or anything else and their recommendations based on your past purchases? Doesn't that happen often? I, I did something a couple of years ago, which is almost comical. My wife, for a birthday present, saw this bathing suit that she liked, and it was on Land's End website. Because I love her, I bought her that bathing suit and some other stuff. I think I got her a new shotgun. But I got her that for a birthday present. That was two years ago. Every single day that I power up my computer, I get bathing suits and ladies' negligees and stuff that I have no interest in. And, and the thing that surprises me is that I'm not buying them, but the ads persist. But this thing about, about automated touch points. Now personal, for example, here's a self-service thing. We have two big insurance companies, Skype and Progressive, 100% online. You take a picture of your damaged car, send it to them, and they send you a check, and oh dear. Um, because so much damage is beneath the surface. Wiring harnesses, uh, all sorts of things like that. So they're often supplemental payments. So, these touch points can be personal or automated, or self-service. That annoys the crap out of me, but maybe you're happy with it. But look at my observation, and I think this is a good discussion point. If you legitimately are thinking about launching a business, you have to struggle with these questions. You have to answer them in a way that's compelling for your customers, not for you. I just want you to reflect on these. A lot of firms try to automate these functions as a cost-saving measure. The consequence is they often alienate customers. I'll give you an example in a minute. So here's a useful question. Do the cost savings exceed the lost sales? Here's a useful example, and you can roll your eyes, but I think it's a useful example. I tend to be loyal in many dimensions of my life, and um, while I was in the Army in 1970 when I returned from Vietnam, I, I bought insurance from a company that's Texas-based called USAA. And uh, I was well pleased on every dimension. Uh, claim service, the, the policies offered, the premium relationships. And I was with USAA for 47 years. So here's what happened. I, I saw over time that USAA was automating or outsourcing a lot of functions so they could save costs. And, and my disappointment was growing. I was regularly disappointed with my interactions. So the, the, the thing that was sort of the final straw is we had a homeowner's claim. We had a pipe burst inside a wall. Nothing we did. A pipe burst inside a wall. We don't know when it burst, and by the time we, we realized that that's what happened, and then the plumber repaired the pipe, there was a great deal of damage. There was damage to the walls, the floor, and a whole bunch of other stuff. This was in our master bathroom. So USAA, because it saves money, it subcontracted a claims adjuster out of Atlanta 
uh, she made a trip to this part of Georgia and she called me at 4.30 on the day she was supposed to arrive and said, uh, I'm in Scriven County, I have two more to do, will you be there at 6.30 or 7? And I thought, I will. So she showed up at 6.30 or 7. She did estimated two costs, damage repairs, and drove from Scriven County to my home in two hours. She spent 25 minutes at my place. She had a tablet and a tape measure. 25 minutes later, a couple of weeks later, I, a couple of weeks, forgive me, maybe a week later, I got a thing from USAA that said, the, we're gonna pay $5,500 to repair this damage. Um, for us to simply pay for the tile in the shower stall, the tile installed in our shower stall cost $5,500. We had a hole in the floor, six feet square, nothing there. Everything's gone, joists, uh, everything gone because of the damage. We had to replace two walls, L-shaped walls. Uh, this repair ended up costing us $23,500, and my insurance company paid $5,500. And because they automated a lot of their responses, I was never able to talk to anyone. I would call in and say, I have an estimate from, from the guy who's gonna repair this, and it's four times what you said you're willing to pay. Nobody would ever talk to me. So but this is not me being a whiny butt, this is me saying that here's a company that I was with for almost a half a century, everything. Everything except health insurance. We had life insurance there, long-term care, umbrella, homeowners, personal uh, valuable property floater. Um, we had everything with this one company for property and casualty plus long-term care and life insurance for almost a half a century. And they just kept cutting back the quality of their service, the number of touch points, the number of interactions. So when I realized that that was my reality, I said, well, I'm going to have to change. Uh, I'm not going to change and put myself in a worse situation. So I spent perhaps a year looking for an insurance company that would, that would not just sort of essentially match the premiums, but offer me better claims service. And I found that and I'm, I'm well pleased. But my point is this company drove me away because it automated and it outsourced and it compromised the quality of service, the number of touch points to the point that I said, after about 50 years, I'm gone. Now, I would have probably used them for another 20 for the rest of my life. But so the truth is, you know, you can argue that it's not a big loss, but when I talk to 100 kids and you find out that this is actually a very big deal, don't make that mistake. Don't try to save money because you're automating or outsourcing, but you alienate customers in the process. And they say, I'm going somewhere else. Big stuff. Big stuff. Revenue streams. You see the top section of this slide. It says there are typically two types. We have revenues that either flow from transactions, like the purchase of a car, or we revenues that flow from repeat purchases. Um, I actually take a couple of maintenance medications. I take a couple of heart meds, and I take uh, Nexium for acid reflux. So I take these medications on a daily basis, and I have for, I don't know, 15, 20 years maybe. So every month I'm in McCook's buying meds, and, and my point is that that's a revenue stream, isn't it? It's not a one-time purchase. Uh, but also look at auto repairs and maintenance. All of our vehicles get oil changes at 5,000 miles, tire rotations at 10. Uh, we, we flush transmission, brake, and coolant fluid at uh, 30, every 30,000 mile intervals. So my point is, a lot of purchases have this ongoing revenue stream, as opposed to being a one-time sale. Like if you look at an asset sale, if I buy a book, hmm, or consumer electronics, or or that should say recreational products, please forgive me. How about usage fees? Does a hotel room charge you a fee to spend the night there? Indeed it does. How about cell phone plans? Many of you, many of us have unlimited plans. There's, there's no upside, but some of us have, have boundaries. But the point is we're paying for usage, aren't we? Subscriptions. I belong to 180 Fitness for 12 years. I'm paying a subscription. Every month I pay for access to the gym. Renting or leasing, all many of you, if you're not freshmen, are leasing an apartment or, or a home somewhere here in town. Uh, occasionally, some of you 
and this would probably describe the freshmen, are, are whipping out the little credit card to do the zip card thing. Um, and then advertising. Um, we're looking at broadcast media like radio stations and television stations, and a lot of the tech companies, Facebook, Google, uh, Facebook's revenue stream, all of it, 100% of it, is from advertising. Um, they they uh, capture and manipulate our private data, and then they sell it to people who want to put stuff in front of us, and you know that. But that's the reality. So all we're talking about is saying, business models typically show either a transaction-based source of revenue or some kind of revenue stream that's recurring, and these are just examples. So what, what's your choice? What path are you going to go down for revenue? Or could you blend it? Could you have both? The answer is you could. Now, uh, two comments more about, about revenue. The distinction between fixed pricing and dynamic pricing. Dynamic pricing is always driven by some component that, that specifically addresses the product or the service combination. Like when I talk about a service combination, if, uh, if an airline is selling tickets for November of 2020, and this is June, don't they have four and a half, five months before that, before that uh, airliner takes off? But what if they're, today's the 23rd of June that I'm recording this, what if they're selling tickets for Friday the 26th, 7th, whatever it is? They only got a three day window. So the closer, see how perishable that is because of the time compression? There are fewer people gonna make decisions to travel in the next 72 hours than there are in the next four and a half months. So what happens is the closer that, that uh, an airline seat gets to flight, the lower its price becomes. Because again, the, rep, the airline would rather fill a seat than have it go empty. Um, perishability. We buy a lot of fresh fruits in my house and we can't get cantaloupe all year long, even if it comes out of South America. But the perishability is a big deal, isn't it? Um, scarcity. Many, many batteries use lithium. The batteries in your tablets and laptops are lithium. The batteries in Elon Musk's Teslas are lithium ion. Um, so my point is that these are relatively scarce, so the price is based on market conditions. So these are just examples of dynamic pricing. And fixed pricing is typically based on the features of the product or service, identifiable variables. Am I going to get a luxury car or a kind of box? Am I going to get a bundle of services or, or, or just something that, that's minimal? So I just as we talk about revenue streams, it was well during this discussion about dynamic pricing and fixed pricing. <clears throat> Key resources. Resources may be owned or rented. And there are four types we'll talk about here and only ever so briefly. Everything here is just meant to be a framework. It is provocative. It's meant to make you think through each of these pieces of a business model and respond to it. So, are your assets going to be physical? Do you have buildings, machines, vehicles? Um, will it be intellectual only? Software, patents, copyrights? How about human assets? Clearly the most important, period. And then financial assets. Do you have cash? Do you have access to capital markets or debt? So in reality, no matter what your asset base looks like, it's going to be some blend of physical, intellectual, human, and, and the financial. And again, th these are questions that you must answer specific to your concept. Key activities. I actually like this simplification, and I credit Oswalder for, for developing it. Um, some types of activities relate to production. We're going to produce something. We're going to make men's shirts or whatever. So, do we have to design the product? Do we have to manufacture it? Do we have to deliver it? Those are all production-related activities. What if we're problem solvers? Um, I, I may misremember this, but I think the East Georgia Regional Medical Center, the hospital here in town, is a 550-bed hospital. And they have all the major specialties covered you know, cardiovascular intervention and acute care and pediatrics and obstetrics and, and uh, orthopedics and all that stuff. So the point is, hospitals can't predict who's going to show up, who's going to have a heart attack, who's going to need knee surgery. Um, 
The only thing we can predict with relative precision would be births, right? If we know the date of conception, we know pretty much when the short kid's gonna come out. So my point is, hospitals are problem solvers, aren't they? Universally. But also, look at people who have domain competence. When your financial affairs become complex, you darn well better have a CPA. If you don't, you are dumber than a rock. Um, auto techs. I'm very comfortable with a wrench in my hand, but a lot of problems in, in, in late model vehicles are not mechanical, they are electronic. And I would have to have not just a scan tool to get the diagnosis correctly, but I would also have to have access to the OEM software, because oftentimes the, the repair is a software patch. You override transmission shift points in electronic transmission, as an example. So my point is, problem solvers, domain experts, and there are so many different domain experts. And, and look at the notion of platforms or networks. Um, all we do here is, is these people manage an interface with users and vendors. Did I just describe Amazon? Heck yes. It's a platform. You and I show up there and we interact with others on the platform. So what is what would your key activities look like? Will it be platform-based, problem solving, or, or production? Again, I credit Oscar Walter. I think he's built a very good template. So key partnerships. This suggests that we have some sort of a cooperative relationship with other businesses. A strategic alliance is a contractual relationship and we both win. Dodge, I don't think in my lifetime, I don't think, but certainly they haven't for the last 30 years, Dodge puts Cummins engines in its diesel trucks. Uh, right now, Chevy puts the Duramax diesel in its diesel trucks. That comes from Isuzu. And for many years, Ford used Navistar. It does not now. But the point is, these are contractual relationships that benefit both parties. Uh, joint Venture says that two or more firms create a new entity. Coca-Cola has joint ventures all over the world. It will go to any market, Zimbabwe, anywhere in the world, and find a local bottler and form a joint venture. Local bottler, you contribute assets, we'll contribute assets, and we'll have this new venture, and we'll, we'll uh, sell stuff in your market. And then, of course, uh, vendors. We have a traditional buyer-supplier relationship. If you're gonna go into business, you're gonna need vendors, unless everything about your business is simply you creating intellectual property. Anything else means you're gonna have some relationship with buyers and suppliers. Now, every one of these forms of key partnerships a vendor relationship, a joint venture, a strategic alliance, they're all derivatives of transaction cost economics. A man named Coas, I think in 1937, won the Nobel Prize for that. But transaction cost economics say that you or I make decisions. Do we make something? Is it an in-house deal? Or do we buy it? So this is, this is infrastructure or market. Do we make it or do we buy it? Every one of these things answers that question. It deals with this notion of transaction cost economics. Number nine, cost structure. Actually, I confess that I'm kind of frustrated with the way this is presented, but I'm presenting the work of someone else and trying to bring it to life, trying to illuminate it. Uh, Osterwalder says that all activities occur costs, of course that's true. And then he talks about two approaches, cost driven and value driven. These are actually not, this isn't a cost structure, these are strategies. These are business level strategies. If you compete on cost, that's called overall cost leadership. If you differentiate your product, that is the only other business level strategy. So, but you look at the way he says this, he says if you focus on costs, if your objective is to push costs to the lowest possible level, you gotta maximize automation. Did you know we're bringing robots to campus? Yes, they're gonna be delivering food in the fall running up and down the pedestrian. I can't wait to see how that plays out. I watched y'all crazy people. I watched what you did with those Lime scooters. You raced them and jumped them and everything else. So now our engineering kids are gonna be modifying these things. You'll be painting your fraternity and sorority logos on them. I know where we're going with this. So, if you're driving costs down, you maximize automation, you outsource. You know how many restaurants and small businesses use ADP for their payroll? Millions of them. 
It's not a critical function. And it, it saves them money to pay someone else to do it. And so the emphasis here, if you're trying to push down costs, is you're literally pursuing an overall cost strategy. When he talks about value driven, I mean, everything has to deliver value. He says you create value by adding features, and I agree with that. Luxury cars. Um, Alexis has lovingly been described as a Toyota wearing a tuxedo because it's the same platform. It just has different trim and badges. When I bought my last truck, my F-150, I chose to get an XLT and then option it just the way I wanted it. And I said to myself when I was in that buying situation, I said, gosh, those King Ranch trucks are pretty cute. Let's see what they cost. So I'm on the Ford website, and the difference between the base price of my XLT and the base price of a King Ranch was 17000 Now, it's the same frame, the same powertrain, the same body. It just says different emblems and badges and bits. And I said to myself, okay, I'm going to let Ford keep all those things to say King Ranch, because I'm not willing to pay 17000 for it. Or the personalized service thing. Um, that is a very big deal in a lot of places. I can go to Wendy's and get a piece of dead cow on a tray, can't I? And I go to Bull and Barrel, my wife and I will spend 120 bucks on dinner. Okay, difference. So he talks about this as, as, as if this is just a, a, a cost approach, and indeed it is not. It's a strategic decision. Am I going to compete on a cost leadership strategy, or am I going to compete on a differentiation strategy, where I literally build in features that make customers choose my products or services over competing products, and they are willing to pay a premium. So although this is presented to you as a cost structure, these really reflect strategies, differentiation versus cost leadership. So now, how do you build one? This is guidance on designing a business model. And of course, to design a script, what does not currently exist. Now these are techniques that are suggested. And some of them, in my view, are just really, they're powerful, that they're rich insights and, and you need to grind through it. Others, less so. For example, if you're gonna have a service-based business, you're not gonna be prototyping anything. You may create some software and have a beta site, but you're not gonna have a prototype. Storytelling, I think, has limited value, but that will be for you to decide. So I'm gonna take a quick pass through each of these. Some of these are profoundly important, and I think customer insights is one. That's the first one that we look at together. So, when you're designing a business model, good design seeks out customer perspectives. Uh, look at this comment on Zipcar. Uh, my memory is that Zipcar is a subsidiary of Enterprise, a well-regarded nationwide auto leasing company. Zipcar and all these other ride-sharing services like WeCar and others were initially responded to the needs of urban dwellers who don't own cars. Fewer than 50% of the people who live in New York City own a car. Uh, the traffic is congested, there's no place to park, so that's why they take cabs and public transportation. Well, boom, hello, Uber, Lyft an alternative to car ownership. So that's why Zipcar and the other ride-sharing services were created. Urban dwellers who didn't own a car, but look at how quickly it spread to other concepts, other applications. College campuses. First we got Zipcar, and then we got Lime bikes, and then we got Lime scooters. Are you kidding me? Death on a stick, yes. But the point is that, that this came from, that this was driven by customer insight. Now, all customer insights have to be primary data. You can't speculate. You have to interact with them and say, what do you need? What are we doing to disappoint you? But this thing about developing a business model using customer insights to drive it is powerful, to, to drive the design. And again, there are other, other pieces that are very important as well. So the next one is ideation. Y'all, ideation is a fancy word for brainstorming. This is just a pure decision-making model. If you're using ideation to help build a business model, you generate a large set of possible solutions, then you evaluate them. And some of them will fall out as bad choices, and others will emerge as, as being probable. 
So then you identify the most promising ones. So again, you're always looking forward. Um, there is one point here that I, I really think deserves emphasis. Um, it's in his work and it's, it's my shared perspective as well. If you're, build, if you're putting together a team, a new venture team, and, and you together, you will collaborate are designing this business model, the, if the team has heterogeneity, there's probably gonna be much more success. It facilitates the process on every dimension. Uh, generating a set of ideas, selection, and everything else. The reason that, hetero, that heterogeneity has value is we look at this from different perspectives. If um, I would never, this is Bill Norton speaking, I would never form a new venture that was made up of four engineers or four marketing people or, or four accountants. And I wouldn't because, because of the homogeneity. Each of them looks at life through the same lens. They have the same training, the same education, the same set of experiences. I would want heterogeneity, differences, differences in education, life experiences, training, because it's those experiences together that could build a, a powerful business model. Okay, visual thinking. Um, I, um, you won't hear me cheering about this, and, and here's what I recognize, and this probably sounds like, like, like it's a terrible irony. Um, I'm not sure that I can teach effectively if I don't have access to a whiteboard. And the reason that's true is every single time I stand in front of the classroom, I'll use that thing for an hour at a time. I'll put five or six or eight different concepts up. I'll develop them. I'll demonstrate it. So I, when I teach, use visual aids because I think they're beneficial. The other thing that's true, and I've known this for almost 30 years, many of you are visual learners. If you hear me or someone else say something, it's not going to click. If you see it, then you tend to learn better. So I know it's ironic that I would say, I think this is kind of goofy. But um, this thing about post-it notes, you get in a room with some other people and you put ideas out of post-it notes and you stick them up everywhere. Stop it. That was probably great in the fifth grade. Um, PowerPoint presentations, there's a time for that. Because PowerPoint presentations can, can take somebody's perspective and it can present it in ways that you and I can interact. We can critique, we can say, that's wonderful, that's goofy, here's another alternative. So it's a great starting point. Um, and, and yes, diagrams and sketches, I do that on the whiteboard all the time. I just think that to develop a business model, this has limited value, but I could be dead wrong. I could be dead wrong. Prototyping. The first line on this slide says, historically, prototyping is product-based. This is actually a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And since you are part of this community, you have access. We have a prototyping lab in, in the CEIT building over in engineering. There's one down at, uh, they actually call it the Fab Lab at, at the, the campus downtown Bay, the Business Innovation Group. Um, and, and one of them is free and one of them is 50 bucks. But the point is you can use 3D printers to, to develop a prototype of your product so that you can hold it, you can present it to people, you can manipulate it. You can say, oh, let's change this, whatever this is. So prototyping is fabulous because you can compete, you can develop competing products simultaneously. Um, you, can, you can literally take them to customers and say, what do you think about this? And the customer may look at that and say, well, how do you put this stuff in it? Or whatever they would say. But the point is it has the potential to meet the user's expectations with very, very minimal cost if you fail. Very minimal. So if you're a product-based company, I urge you to do some form of prototyping. Storytelling. That's lame. I'm going to write scenarios. I like scenarios a lot. Um, we haven't talked about this, but scenarios are a mainstream concept in strategy. Uh, some people are believers in long-term strategic plans. turns out I am not. Um, I think scenario planning is extraordinary. There's so many really successful companies that do nothing but scenario planning. Southwest Airlines, um, BP, the, the British Petroleum Company, Royal Dutch, excuse me, Royal Dutch Shell, 
Um, in the case of Southwest Airlines, uh, I, I haven't studied this for several years, but there was a 20, 25, 30 year period where Southwest identified about 30 probable scenarios and twice a year, most of its mid-level managers would get together and they would rehearse those scenarios. If this happens, what resources do we need? What people do we have to have marshal? What's our next step in the process? Um, so here's, here's the key to scenario planning, and this is really big stuff. I think every one of you in business, in fact, I think you should do this in life, in your own personal lives as well, but let's just stick with business. I want you to, to sort of visualize yourself in some business, I don't care what it is. I want you then to identify any events, any of them, there could be three or six or seven or 25, any events that simultaneously are high probability, high impact. If there is any event in, in the life cycle of your business that has a high probability of occurring, and if it does, it's high impact, you need to develop a, a response for it. It's that simple. Now, when I say it's that simple, I use two examples up here, General Motors and worker strikes. Uh, that's happened to GM in recent years, and it's been crippling. Uh, the company lost almost a, a quarter, uh, three months worth of production. Uh, had, it had no parts for to put together a pickup trucks, which are a, a high profitability segment. Um, dealers didn't have cars and, and vehicles on their lots to sell. So any business that's unionized or that does business with unionized people has this high probability, high impact event, and that is a strike, a labor action. So, and you need to provide for it. So what's our alternative? What is our alternative? I use an example of fuel interruptions at airlines. I'm not talking about the price of jet fuel going up. That's a component of cost and you can adjust prices or be more efficient. I'm talking about you don't have access to the fuel. Uh, I've seen that happen in my lifetime, the air oil embargo. So let me tell you, uh, let me play through that. Let's pretend that you and I together have decided that we're going to launch a regional airline. It's going to be Savannah-based, and right now, we're just going to serve three or four markets on the East Coast. We may serve two in Florida, like let's say Jacksonville and Miami, and we may serve two or three farther up the East Coast. We may go to uh, Washington, D.C., New York City, and Boston. So we're going to have, I'm making this up, we're going to lease three jets, three 50-passenger jets, and we're going to serve these five markets, and we'll use other people for reservations like Expedia or Sabre or something like that, and we'll just pay them a commission. So here's my point. We put together crews and a fixed operating base and that sort of stuff, and we've got three jets flying these five routes, and it may not be every day. So we're running this regional airline, and our source of fuel is interrupted. We can no longer buy fuel. Refiners that made it are offline. Um, people who were fracking have stopped producing crude oil, whatever the case is, but our source of fuel is interrupted. I have seen this. This is not some pie in the sky sort of a thing. So my point is, if that is a high probability, high impact event, you and I need to develop a response. And here's what our response might look like. We might say, okay, let's do this. If we, if we can only get 40% as much fuel as we could, let's just ground two of the planes and never reduce schedule. Or let's coach you. Let's take the reservations, but put the passengers to make the reservations with us on other airlines like American or Delta or United. And when I say coach here, I mean, they pay us a commission. So we're not incurring any costs, but we're generating a little bit of revenue. Um, again, those are just two ideas about how we would respond. We're running a regional airline and our source of jet fuel is interrupted. We can't get it. So code sharing is one, uh, reduced schedule is, is another, perhaps there are others as well. But scenario planning says that in the course of your business, you identify any event that is high probability, high impact. And whatever, anytime you identify one of those, you develop a set of responses for it. Uh, I told you Southwest has about 30. Um, they, one of the scenarios that they plan for regularly, twice a year, uh, it's never happened. The, the company's been flying for 50 years, but one of the scenarios that they plan for is the crash of an airline because they would lose hundreds of passengers and crew. And, and they have a well-designed well response in place. What if you are a bank, a community bank here in Statesboro, Georgia, and you have three branches? Okay, here's, here's a high probability, high impact event. 
your computer system goes down. Okay, high probability, high impact, because you are so reliant on, on computer processing and banking transactions. So you darn well better have a disaster site. You better have your data being backed up in real time at a geographically removed site. I can promise you, if I were the president or a senior officer at, at a bank in this community, I'd have a disaster site in Wyoming. No hurricanes, nor tornadoes, no earthquakes, no mudslides, no Californians, yes, crazy people, yes. All I'm saying is I would have a geographically removed disaster site, and all of my data would be backed up in real time. So I could access that database in real time and pull up whatever I needed to for, for banking transactions, because our system is down for whatever the reasons. Lightning strike, uh, somebody threw a, a, a peanut M&M &M in there and wrecked it, I don't know. So, scenario planning is huge. I, I beg you, do this in business, and, and I think you should do it in life. I do. I forgot what's next. Takeaways. I think that's the last transparency. Yes, it is. So, most businesses that launch do so with a new venture team. There will always be a lead entrepreneur. There'll always be someone who had the concept, who was the driving force, who was sort of the, the champion, the spark plug. But most new ventures will always have a venture team, and it will grow as, as the needs of the business grow. So you need to develop collaborative assessments of all nine of these business blocks. And using these design techniques, that's actually a pretty, a pretty useful approach. I've only poo-pooed one. I poo-pooed the one about storytelling. But each of the others has significant value. And you might find value in the storytelling piece of this design. But the point is, what that should give you is a viable business model should emerge from that process. And that, loved ones, is the end of today's story. So, I have to ask you a question. This is your attendance verification question. And this is pretty big stuff. What is the name of my truck? All right, love you. Talk to you all soon.